Welcome back to TNO, my friends. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover. But we gotta immediately talk about insensitive visionary. Ibuka was cleansing his glasses, lenses. Matsushita fixing his tie, Mori took his cufflinks. The trio sat near the window in the lounge area. I know you two have spoken about the healthcare reform package, let me say. Fujitsu wants in. We will view favorably upon a mixed system by the likes of what Matsushita had proposed. But I also must confess, the returns for this investment would not be sufficient. For Fujitsu to throw in with your lot, better returns must be ensured. I cannot justify such a big expense to the shareholders. I say that in addition to the labor, real estate and equipment, that big five employees get preferential treatment and that Fujitsu be accorded the sole privilege of picking specialists to provide. What you said is all well and good, Ibuka, and your support might as well ensure our, our complete success, but what will you propose to neuter the most important aspects of this reform? What well, always seems to elude you, Marita, is that we have inhabit a living, complex world. There is little space for idealism and ideology in our field. We are in the business of making money. That is where the difference uh, between us lies, Ibuka. You only seek to achieve money, a goal we share, but are too quick to put aside considerations of the how and why. I don't care for the how and why, as long as the goal has been reached with the maximum efficiency. Matsushita uh, stepped in. Gentlemen, we seem to have gone off course. What have you decided, Marita? Let's take a look-see. Well, we have no ordinance right now. Um, you two are not the only players in the game, but that makes sense. I'm sorry, Buka, but this is going to be a refusal. Deal with the devil. Well, let's talk about what we're called in 1955 first, October. We acknowledge the veracity of the Fujitsu's claims. The TR-56 is a substantial copy of the Fujitsu technology and will be withdrawn. We regret that as a result, the Sonus the Electronics Company can no longer remain a uh, going concern and will cease operations. Marita finished a prepared statement, blinking furiously against a barrage of camera flashes next to him. Li Kishin stood and lowered his head, a wordless apology that left their actual thoughts unsaid. They will lose everything again, done in by eventual Ibuka, who spared no expense fighting a ruinous lawsuit. They could complain all they wanted about the cart's bias against a Chinese company or the harassment Fujitsu conducted against their stores and suppliers. Fujitsu was the last one still standing. If there was any silver lining, it was that the boardroom was as crowded as it was. Marita and Lee had fought bitterly until the final hour with the eyes of all Guangdong upon them, just as they had planned. The two accepted no questions as they left the press conference, even as the reporters cried out for President Lee to comment on his uh, chaotic struggle. We're not done yet. Outside Stanley Hill, I bundled Marita and Lee into a waiting vehicle, and sp which sped off into Hong Kong's traffic. We'll change vehicles, then you get to, you to a safe house. How much is left for Fujitsu? Lee asked, squeezing Marita in, in the back backseat uh, footwell. Nothing important, Stanley laughed, for its expression harm, but we better hope our charades made us enough friends to keep us safe. Fujitsu can still collect it if they get their hands on us. So, I think we, re we read this one last time. Insensitive visionary. Hmm, about the hospital, eh? Yeah. But do we need him, really? Hmm. Maximum money. What was the hospital? Oh, I guess Memorial Hospital. Hmm. So, what if we refuse? Can we still pass it without him? So, right now, let's say 24... Oh, we might be able to pass it without him. What if we do that? I don't know. It's December, though. And right now we're doing all right. We got we got wait some time for that. Oh, we're still in New Granada, um, having a good old time down here. And what else is going on? I'll be honest, it's been a, like a day or two since I played last. That's what we need: mountain and jungle conditions that are very hot. Would you look at that? Jungle conditions that are very hot. And uh, yeah, pretty good. Uh, it's almost 67. Sure, why not? We'll do that too. This is jungle. It is jungle. We're going here next. Is it hot enough, though? No, not really. Ah, we're done with that. So, new mount operations next. Uh, looks like we're going to head up north. If you do that, you might get quite a few different areas where you can attack. Maybe? Unless they have mounds around here. Maybe not. Hmm. Ecuador, hey. They got a couple mounts here and there. That quagmires are tomorrow. Well, 44 support. Construction. How many amendments can we have? Well, we got to start voting on stuff a lot. 36 is not very much. 44, 44. Offer employment for such settlement packages. Growth. I want as much growth as possible. Prioritize economic growth by resettling people in the Three Pearls versus sacrifice economic growth to help the people of the rural Guangdong. Increases China's opinion. Hmm. Efficient transport uh, infrastructure. Still, the movement of people and goods all across all of Hong Kong. 
or Guangdong, increases growth by 0.1%, versus Electrify Guangdong, Li Keqing's argument wins out. What you don't like, because that's going to cost us more in the end. That's several power plants Guangdong. I like this one. Remake human, remaking human geography. Incorporate the villages. 30% of Guan, uh, Chong Kong seats. Increases uh, China's opinion. Look at the factories closer to the rural workers of Guangdong and new industrial communities. Factories shall mainly lie in the Three Pearls. Well, yep, sorry, Guangdong's untapped potential. Guangdong sits on a treasure trove of untapped mineral wealth. Rare earth and minerals that can easily be extracted and processed under wafers and transistors that are the lifeblood of the economy of tomorrow. Yet the pressing question of how to treat the Chinese villages and townships that often sit atop these vital resource deposits have never been answered in any satisfactory fashion by our predecessors, and all too often at the expense of the local residents who have been uprooted at gunpoint and settled on the Three Pearls. So this will get 80% from Chong Kong, 80% from Sony, 55% from Matsushita. This one will give us, what, anything? No. Anything here? No. So maybe we'll try that one next, maybe, perhaps. Deal with the devil. Come on, I can assure the new arrival already set up office in the former Yasuda building. Now, not a fortnight later, it was already starting to make that kingmaker's position. As such was a state of affairs, Marita thought about getting that detestable man's opinion on the healthcare matter would prove to be a good measure to keep him in check, to feel the pulse of his character, so to speak. He made a gesture to that phone in the secretary, almost with a hint of fear. Come on, speaking, what is the matter? Hello, Mr. Komai. I'm calling you to get a better idea. I have your opinion of the reform in the works. I recall you expressed yourself in crystal clear terms at the conference. Is that still your position? Thank you for having made the call, Chief Executive, and just at the perfect moment. I was just on the phone with uh, Mukdem. They have expressed a change of heart, and a Nissan conglomerate would not be categorically opposed to the adoption of measures aiming at improving work conditions and safety, of course. Adjustments would be required for contribution to be justifiable. Most appears have expressed in the clearest of terms the need for labor, material, equipment, and personnel to be maturing and employed by the Nissan Group. Furthermore, now Nissanian, uh, Nis Nissan, Nissan, patents, uh, patients, ought to be required to pay for services at a subsidized rate. I'm sorry, Mr. Kamai, but those terms are not acceptable to this administration. We made it clear our commitment to equitable access to healthcare. That can be of no help. My instructions are to present you with a fait accompli. Interesting choice. There you go. Hurry up. Y'all taking forever for God, but not alone. Kam Shun, try not to get grown as the usual end of year motivational slogans materialize on the billboards and the factory walls in the city. Productivity is a soul of labor, towards greater heights in the new year, together for the future Guangdong, all of it written in Chinese as opposed to the usual Japanese. None of it struck home, the government. Chief Executive Marita and his lackey, Li Keqing, meant well, or as well as any Japanese stooge might, but intentions were not enough. Not for the man whose hand was mulched into a pulp at a dodgy factory, or a Kan Shun, who had been fired for daring to report the incident. Kam Shun, few minutes he walked past the slogans, but few others seemed to pay them any heed, not the same kind of cynical weariness as before, but with a casual indifference. Worried more by how to use a bad of Chong Kong groceries, or the latest trends in Sony hardware, or how to use long overdue Lee. He wanted to scream, did they see that nothing had changed? How they sleepwalked into the dreams of monstrous men, the most prominent Chinese and Zhujin event went to Koshu and parlayed at the Chinese chief executive's court. Prostrating themselves for the scraps from the Japanese, but in the face of full bellies and a modicum of dignity, he had been ignored, left to wander alone, until he joined the committee. The Chinese who still remembered the truth, as occluded as it was by honey words and half-hearted promises, reached out to each other. They included wild-eyed Bukharanists, unreconstituted nationalists, dreaming of an unfinished revolution, or those like Kam Shun, who simply saw the system for what it was. It didn't matter, they knew they were not alone, even if Sony and Chong Kong uh, seemed to forget their existence. The community of Chinese labor would protect them. Decisive choice. Oh, look at that. Oh, is this the amount of train we're in right now? Darn it, we're not. Um, with a stack of papers in his hand, Marita Kao wondered who she called to initiate healthcare reform. Ever since the construction of a memorial hospital and the launch of healthcare reform with the CKA's strong support, he had been thinking about the problems in the healthcare system and how to improve it, even while working at his company, but he needed a significant amount of manpower, funding, and active cooperation to implement his ideas. After several rounds of negotiations to secure the necessary funds and manpower for the reform, the only remaining task were to make phone calls, select the most appropriate policy for the reform, and ask for a cooperation. <coughs> Matsushita, Masaharu, um, is the first person he's been reasonable and cooperative with the reform. I don't know if you get landmines. That's really cool. Um, however, selecting his proposal will result in only moderate changes to the original draft. The second plan is Ibuka Masaru and is not interested in Morita's reforms, however. He'll be able to achieve his goals most efficiently if Morita generates enough revenue for him. Third person is Kumai Kunichiro, who has shown a surprisingly bit large willingness to compromise and may be open to considering the proposal. Compromising with him will probably mean engaging in unethical practices, but if Guangdong's major transgressions can be controlled, reform may be more effective. Finally, instruct the Health Commission to begin developing a national health system for Guangdong. Mir shook his head at the radical suggestion, which could be financially ruinous and a legislative disaster. 
but it could be a last resort. If all other options prove unsuccessful, it may be necessary to abandon the reform. Sony Morita may have done enough by setting up a memorial hospital. Certainly a notable cause, but Sony's not obliged to fulfill it. Abandon reform. Two, one step back for two steps forward, huh? Financially insane alternative. That's cool. Financially insane, huh? To the health commissioner. To Masaharu Masashitu. Matsushita Masaharu. Except the reasonable alternatives of moderate reform and share procurement costs. So, healthcare quality will begin to worsen. Hmm. And it's better than uh, Fujitsu, and it's better than, you know, Komai, Hitachi. We'll do that one. Nascent Healthcare, well, we'll, we'll, do, we'll see what we can do. Um, I, I don't want to just completely prioritize Sony, but I kind of like Sony's more. You get Chinese and Zhujin support. You get Chinese support. Growth increased by 0.2. Growth increased by 0.35. Decreased China's approval, but increases Japan's approval. Increases China's approval and decreases Japan's approval. Increased admin costs by 0.15. I don't like more admin costs. I've got to do a strategy, guys, as it is. We simply cannot leave the specialized work of land development, resource extraction, and metals refining to amateurs. We need to bring in specialists to do the work of the quality we require. Without locals nearby to pose a distraction. The transition does not need to be uh, needlessly painful. Rita knows he'll be asking the people to sacrifice their homes for the name of economic development. We must ensure they are compensated appropriately for their loss and give them the help they need to settle their new lives in the cities without being harassed, cheated, or robbed. Nice. We getting there? Good. But you're not going to go in. Uh, I want them to spread out first because we need more mountain stuff. It's fine. Sorry, I'm re re reunion. Suspended upon the backdrop of the caliginous night sky was a serene moon. Its ethereal form and loosened beams of vibrant or brilliant silver alike dangling above people thousands of miles apart. As luster seemingly refreshed with the coming of the new year, exuberantly celebrated for people across Asia. The moon observed the reunion of families, the ebullient and vivacious celebrations filled with euphoria. Yet despite that same moon towering above the workhouses and factories of Guangdong, many the very atmosphere was noticeably absent. Uh, Yang Lok Chi sat in his subsidized apartment in front of a desk upon which resided an empty piece of paper intending to be a letter to his mother explaining his absence during the Chinese New Year. He had just finished another tiring shift at his place of employment, a Matsushita factory dedicated to producing consumer electronics. His work hours increased due to the elevated demand of the New Year's period. Thoughts raced through his mind to contemplate his justifications and explanations for not being able, being beside the person that had raised him and had fed and nurtured him that had recited to him pieces of eloquent poetry when he was young. He put his pen on the paper and began writing. Words appeared describing his struggles and experiences, the sacrifices he had to make to sustain his family, and his everlasting gratitude for his mother. Yang stopped for a short interval of time and deliberated once more. He wanted to promise to be there next year, but in his mind it was clear that he simply could not afford to. The wages he would be missing would be too detrimental. At this, he could only sigh. He peered out of the small, round window beside him towards the elegant moon in the night sky. His mind jumped to a line from an old poem his mother had once recited to him, a line that could comfort both himself and his mother. Though thousands of miles apart, we're still able to share the beauty of the same moon together. I wish you the best of health, Yang Lok Chi. Uh, what a shame. We're working towards a better, uh, better role for us. I think it's that the only mountain here. That might be the only mountain here. Oh wait, there's a mountain right here. Oh god. Uh, is it this tile or is it this tile? It's this tile, so we have to go all the way over here. Huh? Quickly, get over there. Hope and glory. A familiar scene was playing out as the sunset irradiating the landscape with its last few rays. Uh, Guangdong's characteristic neon si signs lit up as if a lighting had struck a tree. But one person was not there to witness it. Far and away, secluded and smoky, barely lit office at the health commissioner. Rejoicing in the solitude, his grand accomplishment. If not for his work, those same people on the street celebrating sundown would have been liable to pay, often times with their life, for Guangdong's negligence in regards to the health and well-being for its inhabitants. Slouch on his leather armchair, a glass of whiskey in his right hand and a cigarette in his left one, pointed at the magnitude of such an endeavor, the sound of a phone ringing he made for a rude awakening. Holding up the handpiece, thinking it must have been one of his inferiors, he lazily answered, Who's bothering? 
Quite an unbecoming of a man for such as yourself, the other speaker replied. It's Lee. We're calling to invite you to a banquet to be held later this week. It's where you'll be honored with Guangdong Civil Service Medal. Does that sound appealing enough? Uh, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, I apologize for the rude answer. It's just a sense of proving the motion. I felt my positions become unrewarding. I feel as if, uh, if, achieve, if having achieved what I worked so hard for has left me directionless. I surely appreciate being awarded with such a high honor, but I have this burning feeling, this willingness to move on. Oh, I get what you're trying to say, but we really need your prolonged presence at this present office. Much work regarding this effective implementation of those policies be required, but who but yourself can know what best that document. If you feel your work is not remunerating, we can always allocate more funding for your stipend, ensuring you and your family a better life still. That won't be necessary, Mr. Secretary. You already have done enough for me. I'll continue pushing for this cause until our mission is fulfilled. As the handpiece fell back into his usual position, the commissioner puffed away at his most exhausted cigarette, going back into a slumber, falling asleep, and as often he had during those intense nights of work in his office yet again for Masterpiece. Look at that! Low income protections with universal coverage, more political power, fantastic, more monthly population, stability, policy cost per capita goes up by an insane amount, better, poverty gets better, healthcare gets better, healthcare quality begins to improve, not slowly, normally improve, ambitious plans, and ambitious success. Fan freaking fantastic Look at that. I knew that would... I had a feeling that would happen. I mean, you have to, a couple of reforms, compromise a little bit, and you get what you want sometimes. So right now we're at nascent healthcare, which is meh. But if we can get to uh, developed healthcare, we get 10% more stability. And advanced healthcare would be fantastic with world-class healthcare following up beyond that too. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, approval, meet Japanese representatives. We can still do that. We can ask for financial aid, but we don't really have to. This would be nice. Oh, this would be good for growth, but I don't want to piss off the Chinese. I want as much support as possible first. Is this some... Is it, this... Can you help out here? Look, all I care... We got it done. Nice. So now you can just wait and hold. Now we can win the war for you guys. That's all I care about. We got what we wanted. New way of doing it. It was a partly cloudy day in the rural village in Guangdong, but the streets and shops were almost as empty as if the Pearl River had just burst its banks and forced an evacuation. The reason for this was the presence of Yu Wai Chao, a government employee tasked with planning out implementing mines in the rural districts. Given that in times as recent as rules, uh, Suzuki Tai Chi, people had been driven out of their villages. In order to build this sort of mine, the villagers were afraid and resentful. Yu understood this very well, why the villagers were worried, and was sympathetic, but the fact that they were all running away from him and blocking their, up their doors was weary, wearing away at his patience. At last, he managed to take hold of one of the villagers and ask him why they were all running away. The answer was expected. You go tell your scumbag of a chief that we aren't moving anywhere, not even if they found pearls or jade under here. You sighed. I'm, this, I'm not here to do anything of this sort, I'm just here to talk. I'm not going to force anyone to do anything, but the government really needs me to reach out to you. The villager was convinced by the earnestness of Yu's facial expression. All right. I'll trust you for now, but if you're lying, I'll tear you limb from limb myself. You rolled his eyes and nodded his agreement while the villager went out to the bring his neighbors. Unfortunately, it took two hours for you and his new acquaintance to convince all of them to talk to him. A new, more humane approach. And eventually we'll do the Rural Development Ordinance. We've taken the initiative to present a new way to develop the rural regions of Guangdong in a manner that we believe is most humane and efficient. Now we have to make sure that everyone else is held to the same standard we are. We'll approach your legislative council with a bill codifying best practices in rural resource development projects and seek the agreement of the other corporations in the interest of Guangdong's long-term stability. Absolutely. Oh, God. Oh, we have to vote for this. What is this? Meet Chinese representatives. Oh, yeah, that's because of all this stuff. Yeah. Oh, I would like to crop. Do the crop purchase. Um, so I'm hoping... Oh, this to get plus more growth. Uh, agriculture. So that's why I saved. Because if we do this one, do we get, like, can we, like, bribe other people to help us out? Well, not bribe, but, you know, coax the gears maybe a little bit to see if we can do more. Because eventually we do want to go down this way, too. So, 48 seats. We should have done that one. Oh, well. Let's see what happens. Are we fighting Nazis or those Peruvians? Oh, no, they're Nazis. It doesn't matter to us. We don't really care. Can you guys actually win here? No, I don't think so. Can you guys win here? Maybe. Happy February, though. 1967. Hmm, Rashtar winning. Look at that. Arise Saizo is doing pretty, a pretty darn good job. Becoming a panzer leader, maybe an engineer, maybe a trickster. Oh, maybe an organizer, huh? I want to do this one. Let's see. I don't mind compromising a tiny bit if we have to. Ooh, now we're losing. That's not good. Now we're winning. Go figure. 
1947 war in China is over. So the newspaper said in bold print. The day off saw Somber Lamb dash towards the docks in pursuit of a luck, a luck that he thought would never come. He rushed towards the postal office moored at the side of the warehouse, down by the pier. The small sea brine followed him inside, further to the furlough tip. He approached a counter where the usual clerk sat behind a uh, screen. So hey, he said, coughing up any news today? The habitually exasperated clerk looked at her up from her work and gave him a wry, slight smile in that instance she was almost beautiful. Actually, yes, yeah, she lifted a briefcase from underneath her with a few documents and a letter. Sign here and here. Uh, a few pen strokes later, Lamb ran and ran, joy bounding in every leap. Breathlessly, he shut the door of his room and all but tore the envelope where that letter was at it. With a smile on his face, Lamb sat down to read. I'm sorry, Red. I hope this letter reaches you in good health. How's on come? Hey, it must be rough living there as a porter. The briefcase that comes with this letter ought to contain some money for you to start a new life there. When you see your mother, please tell her that I cannot risk or shirk my duty in America. If you don't hear from me again, don't worry. Sincerely yours. That night, Lamb walked by the piers again, and alcohol slicking his feelings. The world was his. He had made it. He held back an urge to shout. Stab. He drew one cigarette from his breast pocket and lit it, dragging him for a long while. The next years held so much promise. Lamb how soon did not think he could fail. We were all brave ones. Yeah. Waking moments next. Oh, we actually lost. Dang it. That sucks. But he's learning to give an organizer and whatnot. That's supportive. Ah, that kind of review. If you want to read this, please go ahead. Look at that. So he was very pleased. Ah, fantastic. Get back to work. Japanese expats love it. Zuzhin loves it. Increase in Japan's approval by 5%. They will expect 37.467 billion in GDP by the end of next year. Oh god, this is going to give us more corruption. Stop increasing our seats. God dang it. Because right now that puts us at 22 seats, which is not bad, but still. They love attacking us. Did you actually win here? No. Oh god, no. Absolutely no chance of you winning here. In all honesty, why don't you just go clip me this way? I'm gonna go down here. You know what? Do, can we help them out? Or do they need help? It looks like they don't need help. No, I'm just gonna keep it here for now. Economy is. Deficit's not ideal. I don't like that. The deficit's pretty bad. Dead GDP ratio is going up. Oh, but waking moments. In a quiet moment before the start of the day, Leong Kwok Yu wondered if he'd made the right decision to stay in the village. <clears throat> the Sony men stopped by weeks earlier, weathering the withering glares of the populace before leaving a message. Sony wanted to build a mine, and they were willing to pay to relocate the village elsewhere. The elders refused to meet them then, marveling that they hadn't brought police encouragement, but they would be back. They always were. The next time the Sony managers knocked on the village's gates, Kwok Yu and the elders had heard them out. An opera compensation, shelter, and a factory job in a new town less than a dry day's drive away. Uh, open to anyone who wanted it. Anyone who didn't want to leave could stay, but Sony would bring their own men and equipment to make sure that the lake outside the village was properly drained before excavation began. That hit Kwok Yu like a hammer blow to the head. How many lazy mornings had he spent on his shore with a fishing rod in hand? How many sunsets had enjoyed there with his late wife by his side? He remembered. Tossing his tea on the crispy press suits, screaming that he would never agree to it before storming out. If he was surprised by the lack of a police visit afterwards, he wasn't surprised by the stream of departures that followed Sony. That followed Sony and their government had pockets deep enough to take their meat message directly to the villagers. The young and restless went first, followed by their parents and their grandparents, keeping the family together while the village drifted apart. But that was never the answer Kwok Yu and the remaining villagers would give them. A sentiment reaffirmed every morning by the roar of the mining machines coming to life. They could write, they could own the village, but not the memories inside. Did you actually win here with so little organizer, nice. Matsushita's request. So, you're willing to push for a proposal in the council in exchange for Matsushita sat across from Marita, his hands folded in his lap, in exchange for a first bid on the new government contracts, and for her referential access to the new markets this initiative will open up. He smiled, unleashing rural Guangdong's untapped potential is a good slogan. And I agree there's a lot to be unleashed, that's why I want to be the first one to harness it when it is. Marita nodded. Once a big cut, so I'll give him that. 20%. Well, 20%, would that be enough? We need one more. Let's see what we got here. We could bribe our own seat, too. Get cracked on petty corruption. 29%, not bad. Those who follow, big brother, I saw a whole lot of buses coming in from the countryside. Did you see it too wide? Almost two a day, nice. Yeah, hey, I saw it too. I asked a policeman about it, and it's apparently it's a group of new arrivals. Lee Chun was bemused hearing what his siblings were talking about. He decided to take upon them, or take them to the nearest bus stop, so he could confirm what Y and Hay were saying. Five or six buses were stopped at the bus stop, under the clear but smoggy Koshu sky. New arrivals, clearly from the rural regions, were filling them out, filling out of them. 
They're disoriented, but they clearly have more on them than the Lee family had when they came in. Some money and an amount of personal effects in addition to clothes on their backs. They're also escorted by policemen and Zushin guides, all talking in Cantonese. Welcome to Koshu, ladies and gentlemen. I understand this must be really disorienting and confusing. Please don't worry, however. The government's arranged everything for you that you need and a place for you and your families. Please follow us right this way. Uh, as the guides kept shouting, Chun Li and Wai felt kind of sad. This is a better reception than we ever got, Wai said. Hey, not it, but Chun said, well, that's a pass. We've moved on, we've got better things to do, let's be about them. Wishing the newcomers luck, they went back to their own lives. Look at that, 70%? Nice. Not bad. Better real GDP growth, or better uh, Republic of China opinion cap. Simulation is up. 82%, go with the cap at 95%, not bad. 66%, which is not great, but still, whatever. You know what? I think we've got time. Let's see. Not bad. Good. And this one is decent. Um, there's a difference of 8. Difference of 10. This one's a difference of way too much. 20. This is a difference of way too much here, too. So, the ten 8 is not bad. 8 I can work with. Nice. We're getting there. Of course, it doesn't increase monthly corruption gain anymore. But it's good. This is not good. We should focus more on these states than these states. Hmm. Actually, that probably make more sense. But we're doing this one anyways. We want more uh, uh, Zujin support. And it will help us lower corruption too. Because right now, corruption is a what percentage? 0.21 every month. Oh, we can investigate local members. Ah, dang it. Ah, uh, whatever. That'll be something like the next one. So we really need one more vote. So if we do this one. Uh, with the Masuchita, we'll get the following. Oh, GDP growth will decrease. So we get an increase of way more anyway, so. Votes for cash. Murder's eyes scan two men sitting opposite him. Lee Kishin and Stanley Hillman his gaze. Gentlemen, he began. We run into a summing block. Certain factions of the council whose votes are necessary to pass in the latest policy initiative have proven less than open to negotiations. These more direct methods will be required. Stanley smiled calmly. Bribes you mean good to finally see you drop on the pleasantries and getting serious. Um, Lee said nothing, simply rubbing his chin in contemplation, no doubt. Uh, already coming all the ways to get a bit of legitimate money into the bank accounts of various council members. Think you two can handle it, Marita asked. Lee nodded. I can get in touch with some of the junior members of the faction. Stanley's smile grew. I can run the funds through my more discreet accounts. And if the money doesn't talk loud enough, I can spice up the offers with some hard-to-come-by luxuries. Marita nodded, satisfied. What's this? Huh. You know what? We're going to say no, and we're going to choose whatever the cheapest option is. One more Sony seat. Well, it's five, five political power cheaper and half corruption cheaper. Increases corruption, unfortunately, for us, but it's worth it. Nice, we actually got something without breaking the bank too much. It's actually really good. Investing in the future, huh? We need to do that one, too. This one shouldn't be too bad to do, so I think I wrote this one last time. And 49 so that's nice. As well as a housing crisis. So if you want to read about this one, too, please go to head two. Oh, we should have done, uh... Oh. Well, darn it. I was so in a rush to get that done, but we should probably get a lot of these things done, too. It should be okay. Overall, man. The challengers. Oh, crap. If you want to do this, please go ahead. <sighs> Bruh. This is so stupid. Man, I hate artificial limits to us. Hold them off, boys. Hold them off. Oh, look at that. They did it themselves. Oh, or maybe, maybe not themselves. I see Japan here is pretty strong. Yamauchi Hiroshi leaning on the metal railing of a perched atop the Nintendo factory, gazing upon the dozens of workers, other stations diligently crafting and assembling Nintendo's products. The sound of thick sheets of paper being methodically cut into card sized pieces filled the room as industrious workers, men, women, Chinese, and Japanese alike, operated. Uh, the sleek machines that gave Nintendo's Hanafuda cards their striking designs and flamboyant colors. Yamauchi stared, in awe of the factory floor, admiring the streamlined processes of the machines and the sturdiness of the workers. He got on so far from sifting through mounds of financial paperwork to trying to salvage Nintendo and subsidizing off meager yet exorbitantly priced instant rice. Now, the numbers proved it, too. Yamauchi stopped to examine the clipboard he held in his hands and increased in not only the profits but also the productivity of Nintendo, and the financial report stated was glaringly obviously obvious to him. He put it down once more and went back to gazing at the factory, reminiscing of the time he listened to Chief Executive Marita's inauguration speech in that old cramped office of his. He recalled having dismissed Marita's promises as naivety and contemplating the integrity of his character as a soft sunlight illuminated the factory floor, just as it did to his desk all those years ago. He remembered, uh, scoffing at the idea of having merits over race, and having Japanese and Chinese workers being treated equally as he glanced upon his employees and Christopher Harmony, 
He doubted if Marita was sincere and wondered if his promises were just as fake as Sony's early radios, but Marita's message still resonated with him, even in the face of his cynicism. As the bell rang out through the factory floor signaling a break for the workers, a single thought drowned out of all the memories he had had of listening to Marita's speech. On those new, distant days, he made a promise he could keep. Hey, we actually got this tile too. Look at that. Nice job, guys. Passage of the Rural Development Ordinance. Marita K.O. is on a roll, and no one in the Legislative Council is going to stop him. He kept speaking to even as many of the Hitachi and Fujitsu delegates booed him in a vain attempt to get him to shut up. Ladies and gentlemen, the opposition arguments involving the rural citizenry in developing the land and extracting its resources is somewhat inefficient and wasteful so far off the mark that it beggars, uh, that it beggars belief. What they in their foolhardiness fail to realize is that the increased workforce this bestows in fact paves the way for the stronger, better workforce for the next generation. Ibuka Masaru scoffed. The chief executive takes, talks a big game, but all he's actually done is train a whole lot of farmers to become miners when they're no good for that kind of labor. But it's all he got for his argument was the jeers of the Sony and Chung Kong delegates and rolled eyes from Matsushita and his delegation. Come on, try to convince the undecided by making insinuations about how well Matsushita's support had been attained. I have every reason to believe that Sony, Chung Kong, and Matsushita have all had their bottom lines padded. They all stand to benefit from this deal. But all this got was half-hearted reactions from his and Ibuka's delegation. The Matsushita delegates merely smirked. The Sony and Chung Kong factions were laughing. Masashida and Masaharu joined the three delegations, making light of Kumai. You say you stand a benefit, and bottom line is padded like it's a bad thing, when everyone really knows you're just bitter because you weren't able to get that kind of deal for yourself. In practice, Mr. Kumai, you're the only one who can, you can blame for this, opposing this. The room erupted with laughter. So the Royal Development Ordinance passed amidst uproariousness, uh, uh, uproarious, tear-inducing laughter at Kumai's expense. Marita and Lee each sent Masashida a bottle of his favorite sake, with compliments. So basically, we get increased growth by 0.45%, we get better uh, Chinese government support, industrial expertise and industrial equipment go up as well, as well as agriculture societal development. Overall, not bad. I'm very pleased with that. Give it a day. Nice. So, what do we got next? Oh, what is this? The Labor Relations Commission. 46 seats. It's not bad. We know votes. That's pretty fast. 40 seats. 44 seats, 36 seats, good god. Hmm. We still need to invest in our future. We got a lot of things we gotta invest in here. Anything up here? Oh, I did read this one too last time. Just in case we need it for later, too. Increase the next release product's profitability by 12.5%. Increase growth by 0.35%. 20%? Oh my god. Or permanent growth by 0.35%. Japanese expat, thousands of cinemas, sports and arts, the Lion Rock Spirit. Oh my god. Well. 35, my god. We could struggle and do this one, maybe. Reform the civil service. Full localization at Sony and Chung Kong seats, because this one will start with what? 75% uh, for both Chung Kong and Sony. Alright. Reduces Matsushita and Fujitsu seats by 10%. So 20% and 0%. Admin efficiency begins to improve. Localized civil service. A trusted core. To maintain the quality of public services, we must maintain a trusted core of Japanese trained civil servants. Add Sony and Chung Kong seats, reduce Masashida and Fujitsu seats. Keep trusted core. Zujin opportunities will expand, but we'll keep a trusted core of Japanese expatriates for higher administrative positions. Huh. Semi localized civil service. So we definitely want to go that one. Hmm. School shortage. I like that. Academic base will really start taking off. I like all these. Yeah, I think we're gonna do this one next. It gives us time to build up maybe a little more political power, perhaps. So if you read this one again, please go ahead. Human Capital Advancement Ordinance, because I do want to do the Lion Rock Spirit. So 48 seats, still not bad. I think I read this one too. So if you read this one again, please go ahead. Like I said, without homes, Guangdong will fester in crime and, and inequity. We'll tackle the housing crisis being faced by the bottom line. Here's the Chung Kong's initial support for the ordinance. Poverty rate begin to improve, which I do like as well. Build the bed towns. The space in the three pearls urban areas is limited by design, and architecture can only build so high without posing a safety risk. The best solution is to find land close to the cities and develop them into the commuter towns. Residential districts connected by rail with, with the main city, so that there's throngs of workers will have somewhere to sleep other than the miserable tenements in the city slums. They may not be pretty, but these new towns will be a huge step up from the rat warrens these masses live at the moment, and will free up a viable real estate within the city proper. God dang it, if you want to do this, please go ahead. That sucks. Less corruption. Hey, civility's 47%, that's not bad. Uh, I'd rather you go here. You might be still attack, be able to attack an airport. Can you do anything here? Yeah, don't worry about it then. 
Can you help out here, maybe? Yeah? Yeah, let's try to take over the airport. Can you help out here, maybe? Yeah, it's alright. Whatever. Economy. Ooh, the deficit's not good. But growth is almost 13%. That's not bad. Keep it up. He's learning to become a pantsulator still and an organizer. I love it. I love how you took over the towel for the airbase and then you just left the airbase open. It's not bad. Decreases corruption. I like it too. It's too high in my opinion right now. 7.5%. Ugh. It's almost at 40%. I like that you're adventurous. Can you actually do this? Can you beat those Nazis up? I don't want to uh, sacrifice Chinese government support unless it's like maxed out, which is not. Neither, none of these are maxed out. So, and he's learning level skill level four, and becoming an organizer. That's pretty good. Things are looking up for us, guys. Things are really looking up for us. That's fantastic. Investing in human capital. Followed up with uh, finding skilled labor. Oh, happy May, everybody. How are we 36 minutes into this video? I don't understand. I really don't. I'm enjoying this way too much. Time is flying by. Why can't most of the day fly by like this, you know? Just, you have so much fun when you're doing stuff like this, man. You go here. Housing crisis. Lee Kishin and Morita Kale sat down to discuss the latest problem bedeviling both their companies, a shortage of skill of local labor. As the vast majority of Japanese university graduates that might apply to one of the major companies of Guangdong chose instead Matsushita of Fujitsu, Sony and Chung Kong instead invested the resources into training people on the job while personally reaching out to promising candidates in order to stay competitive. But as Morita said, this isn't sustainable, especially not. And we want to grow on our flank of uh, the competition. Either we need people trained to do the job or direct financed, directly financed, or by giving the people the savings they need to send their kids to school. Have you got any suggestions, uh, Kashin? Uh, Lisa marked. Yes, I've got just a thing. Let's provide uh, public education or public housing to the Zhujim, and more importantly, the Chinese. Nobody else is going to do it, so we'll have to. Best of all, the people will know just who to thank. Murder's eyes widen. Don't you think how much this could cost us? Lee smiled conspiratorially. There's no need for us to cost all that much personally. And we're clever about how we rebate the cost, or for that matter, how we set up the businesses. A lot of comp comprehension down in Marita's eyes and his lips curled into a smile. It's a darn good idea, Kishing. So right now we're at 49. Jesus, that's really good already. Our economy become more centralized. So right now, how's our economy looking? We're a corporate oligopoly. And so centralization, 30 out of possible 40. Uh, cool. Factory output, docket output from, from centralization. We get bonuses from decentralization for construction speed and production efficiency base. So we'll lose a little bit of that construction speed and efficiency base for more output and efficiency gain and cap. Interesting. Yeah, this is good to know. You definitely cannot do in there. Can you? Can you actually win there? Culmination. Oh, look at that. Ooh. You know, as much as I like increasing uh, military factory sizes, uh, I prefer this. Paper had a remarkable uh, ability to obscure, confuse, and obfuscate when deployed in a certain way. If used differently, it could be enlightened, clarifying, sharp, but if paper could scream with joy, this paper certainly would. The figures painted a beautiful picture of growth and progress. Cap capping it all off was a single page at the end of the report, contained a single graph. A simple one, GDP over time, one line inch upwards, the other startling a fair way below it, uh, rocketed skywards. The two lines met just before the end of the graph. It was official. Guangdong's economy had outpaced that of Manchukuo. Marita grinned when he saw it and handed it over to Lee and Stanley afterwards like it was a toy to show and tell. Can you believe it, Marita, Marita said to nobody in particular, leaning back in his chair. One day I'm broke and the next I'm in the head of the fastest growing economy in the sphere. The invisible hand, Stanley replied, raising a glass of champagne in a mock toast. To think we came all this way just for our own companies, not to be overly sentimental, but it does seem like a long time ago. The new jewel of the sphere, Lee agreed, clinking glass with Stanley. I'll drink to that, so what's next for us? First match equal, then the roll? It's obvious, Marita said, leaning over the table towards him. We're making a new world here. A world for people like us, tied to nothing and nobody. All the done innovation floating around in the world. It's coming here. We've got the money, we've got everything we need. Stanley smiled and began to wait to her Phil's glass. I think that deserves another toast, so let's take a Guangdong cheers. As the Empire of Manchuria lies beneath us in sheer GDP. The gadgets here, Guangdong and Guangdong Superman, have proven their versatility and excellence of humane capitalism. <coughs> By leveraging the strength of the Zhujin and Chinese granting local effects. So we have four more seats in total, but that just tells me we're going to lose those seats to corruption. Increases Chinese, Zhujin, and Japanese expat support, increases Chinese and Japan's approval by quite a bit, too. Nice, we can honestly use that. 
61%, so we're not going to hit the max cap yet, but we're getting there. Mm -hmm. So right now, they'll get up to 20%-ish eventually. We got another 13. Fantastic. Government support. Government support changes by a very tiny amount. Not good. Huh. 30% is not bad. 93%. We're approaching the cap, too, so we need more opinion uh, from them. So more transport would be good. Nineteen forty nine part one. Daily routine. A man woke up at six in the morning every day, always early to work. With his father's money, he rented a small office in Kowloon, setting up a small silk firm there. Their niche, tailoring equipment, and lots of it. The silk trade had not halted in the shadow of Japanese victory. Instead, a boom rocked the province of Guangdong. As Japanese investors flocked into the capitalized on the silk trade. After a breakfast of porridge and salted fish, he went to his firm to talk about with clients and tour the mulberry fields just up the countryside from Hong Kong. On this occasion, it was another midday summer, the silkworms. Were busy at work uh, aside of those stems where the berries grew. Pale silk moths fluttered between the rows of neatly planted trees, whose uh, trunks stalked the sun in stark shadows. A few of Lamb's friends explained to the bus suited Japanese men the history of the silk trade, its origins during the dynastic eras, and Lamb's history with it all. He remained quiet. Though he was a better Japanese than he used to be, he still could not speak it fluently. In those days, uh, he carried a gun with him. A uh, discreet army surplus in Nabu was a trusted companion on the rural roads uh, outside of the Three Pearls. The new Republic of China's army was still in its infancy, small and incom incompetent at best. He didn't even need to fire it a lot of the time. Point at a prospective bandit and he would back off. If that didn't work, he fired in the air. He seen a half dozen men split up at this approach. He'd come home around 7 in the evening, just in time to put his feet up and read. Lamp thought of the phrase that eluded his mind time and time again. The blue seas turned into mulberry fields. Look at that, we're winning so well. Oh my god. We're doing so well. And we have the product up next soon, coming too, so. Building an Ammon office. Chun Kong Public Housing will be added to a sort of laws. On the streets, Yoshiko grimaced as she shaded her eyes with a free hand. Clutching a clipboard tightly in the other, she stood on the corner of one of Koshu Zujin districts. A gaggle of minibuses and motorcycles sent dust swirling around the hem of her dress as she struggled to campus, crowd over the deafening clamor of passerby and vehicle horns. Her interviewee scurried away as she spied a familiar figure in a peaked cap approaching the distinctive Bahuinya of the police badge flashing in the midday sun. Hello, Officer Ayashi. Yoshiko greeted the officer cordially and stilt the Cantonese, crossing her arms irritatedly. You just cost me an interview. And you're loitering, Lamb counter. What are you doing? Thinking of writing something about the housing crisis. You know, the chief executive promising new houses, better houses, working utilities, all that, but it's slow going. Yoshiko ran a finger through her hair, new shortly shortened for punishing summers. You don't think it's because it's getting better, Lamb said hesitantly. Yoshiko's Cantonese was, if elementary, at least understandable now. That's not the problem. Then what is Yoshiko looked directly at Lamb? Can you help me understand? <clears throat> Um, Lamb regarded Yoshiko for a moment. Are you sure? Yeah, Yoshiko nodded. And Lamb shrugged. Fine, if she wanted to see the worst Guangdong could offer, she could be his guest. She, he took out a slip of paper and scribbled an address. Take a long lunch tomorrow. It's dangerous. Too dangerous at night. Plumbing, power, progress. We have started building new communities for the people of Guangdong, but those communities lack the basic creature comforts of pr a productive life. Properly, uh, proper plumbing and electricity for a start. By ensuring our people can bathe and stay warm in the winter in their own houses, we can save the time they would otherwise spend going to communal baths or taking trips to the wall, and maybe even put a smile on their face while we're at it. So we have one amendment, no amendment, two amendments. Oh, we might actually be able to do this one too? Maybe not. Labor ordinance legislation. No, that's not for labor. I guess labor was over here, huh? That's eh, alright. If we don't get to it, we don't get to it. It is what it is. Four and a half percent is going to drop us down to even more. Look at that. 0.13. That's nice. Look at that. Oh, I'm getting elections, huh? Well, we're on a roll. Post war naval infantry equipment because we really need that, yes. Uh... Get in there, boys. Nice. Can you really win here? I guess it's a Japanese armor division, but still. Von Hassel took us over to German Africa. Huh. Oh, that's a different type of African devastation. I did not know that. That's kind of cool, actually. Maybe just hold for now. Can you do anything here? No. Ah, beginning of the product cycle. We support Sony. Of course we do. Off the streets. Yoshiko and Lamp pace back the shop fronts on recessed apartment gates and jury rigged electric meters built into the endless tenement wall, avoiding mounds of garbage piled next to the Hold Street. So one of Yokoshu's walled cities, a rumor 
came alive for Yoshiko in the most unpleasant fashion. Mm. Eventually, the lab in a civilian dress pushing it on an unattended gate, revealing a narrow alley crowned with men and dogs, cast in a perpetual shadow by hanging laundry and AC units, dripping water up from ten floors above. Ten floors above. A oh, uh, wave of uh, wet heat rushed towards the two, reeking of sweat and other excretions. Uh, Yoshiko gagged her diaphragm heaving into her chest. You want to see how people live? This is the worst of it, Lamb said, an edge in his voice. Any decent person, any Japanese one for sure, turns back here. But don't forget, you wanted to come. You wanted to see... Uh, Yoshiko heard the same unsaid challenge. Don't back out now, coward. She stepped across the threshold, stepped gingerly towards the puddles of the fetid water. For 30 minutes, the two navigated the city's worn like interior, observing life bustling against the humming of power transformers and backstreet factories. A cove and a children kicked a ball in front of a bags of rice and dried seafood, dancing around the husk of an attic trampled against the wall. An unlicensed doctor advertising his services in front of a brothel's telltale lights, while a mailman hurried past the work gang hauling crates of fish balls towards the outside world. It's a completely different world, Yoshiko said quietly. Like it or not, the walled city is life for thousands of people, Lamb muttered, though m n maybe not life as you understand it. By accident, disease, or poverty, this is all they have, and they make do. Cool. Look at that. Div R four A headphones, huh? Well, we've got time. This time, did Mexicans last time? We could go to the Turks. Chinese. Product probability. Yeah, we'll go to the Turks. We got a little bit of political power to spend, so we're gonna do that one. We might do some of this one. How high is the Japanese approval? It's pretty high, but it's not bad overall. Fifteen percent is pretty good, though. And I'll do it by three percent. Why not? We'll do it this time. And we're up political power. What else is new, though? You in here? There we go. It's not bad. And happy June, everybody. We're doing well. A paved garden. A sigh of relief escaped Kazushi's lips as he surveyed the unblemished landscape of the river valley. He expected that there would be people living here, people who were already suspicious of the government and who the land bureau would require him to deal with. Fortunately for him, although the smokestacks of Koshin Chokai were visible in the far distance, the immediate area was uninhabited. The survey would be a simple matter, and he might even have time to relax, of course. Getting this far into the wildlands had not been easy. Uh, even his government-issued chief had trouble navigating the uneven dirt road that served as a tro sole transport link to this area. Now, that he's here, though, Kazushi found himself suddenly at peace. Far from the internal drumbeat of the city, he now found wide-open grasslands and wooded areas still brimming with wildlife. A memory came unbidden from his youth of running through the woods outside his home in Matsumoto. Here, in places where the hungry corporate beast of Guangdong had yet to stake its claim, the beauty of nature still lived. Of course, Kazushi's job was to help set beast extend its reach, and so he got to work. Over the course of the day, he hiked across the area and taking notes of the local level and the elevation of the surrounding hills and the periodic samples of the water table. In his mind, he saw the eventual effects of his work. The grassy fields by the river would be paved over and replaced with concrete apartment high-rises. The forest would be felled and rail lines would be laid through the desolation. The floodplain would be transformed into a pumping station to sustain a growing population. All will give room for the ever more numerous denizens of the state to live. Kazushi did his job and did it well. A part of him felt wistful as he prepared to leave, knowing the fate of this untouched land, but he knew it was inevitable. That it had remained unblemished for so long was only due to its lack of natural resources. Now space was a resource more viable than gold, and the state grew ever hungrier for it. With well, final glance at low vistas, Kazushi started his truck and began the arduous journey back to make his report. Paradise soon to be lost. A schooling shortage. Between the low literacy rates and even lower levels of technical incompetence, much of our large population are simply unproductive. For Marito, ensuring the populace be becomes educated and literate is an absolute requirement in order for Guangdong, along with Sony and Chun Kong, to grow to their full potential. Yeah. Ah, Finland one. Good job. Yeah, that's not good. In the salon, so far about the streets. The doughiness of Guangdong's Japanese society cleaned on overstocked chairs in a resplendent, brightly lit lounge, sipping delicate teas and nibbling sweets while exchanging quiet whispers. The Matina facade of civilian decorum, even if the subject was anything but. You have read the most recent issue, haven't you? The woman exchanged knowing looks, the question of formality. It's unbelievable. The sensationalism that passes as journalism these days. Rampant overcrowding, mailmen jumping over past out attics in the street, children playing in pools of waste water, a skeptical of Hathi Hoff. It's a bit too much. Who benefits from a story like this? Uh, that's obvious, a naturally 
voice admonished Morita. Are we surprised the man is more Chinese than Japanese now? And a little exaggeration surely isn't out of character for his kind, all to get attention and sympathy. The simple woman nodded serenely, smiling as they sipped their steaming tea before an exciting gasp turned their heads. Yes, Ukawa Yoshiko, isn't wasn't she Yes, the matron sighed dramatically, the late baron's daughter, reduced to writing nonsense for spare change. How unfortunate. Well, the assembly tittered in scandalized agreement before setting Yoshiko's article to the side, as their attention shifted to the more mundane affair of a soiree to be hosted by the Matsushita officer. They failed to notice uh, Sachiko, accompanying her mother between university semesters, eyeing, thumbing through, and finally taking the entire magazine for herself. Sachiko barely slept, the images haunting her in her sleep. Who builds bedtowns? Once again, Marie sat on his desk, part of the options before him. Well, the government's decision to invest in building new bedtowns, lucrative state construction contracts, had just opened up. He had two choices for how to handle them. The obvious choice was given his allies and Chung Kong for his choice of the contracts. This would shore up their bottom line and avoid giving a boon to his political rivals. But perhaps such a boon was just what it was called for. If he allowed Matsushita's groups, as well as other outside companies, to bid for the contracts on an equal basis, it would be a gesture of good faith that could make them more open to cooperation in the future. Of course, they could just take the handout and give him nothing in return. Hmm. We'll use Chung Kong contractors as expensive Japanese expats. Open up the, the building. Can we afford that? 5% Sony seats, 5% and reduce 5% of everybody else. 5%, 5%, 5%, 5% more, 5% more. Uh, it sounds like we're going to reduce our risk. Increase our risk. Um, well, like normal, save. And what do we have? We have 51 seats, so... We're down to 49. It's not ideal. But then I don't want to reduce the seats to them and whatnot. I don't want to decrease police control, but we have so much uh, here. Support, it's not funny. We could burn it if we had to a little bit, but... Let's see what happens. How many more days do we have? They're not even voting, so we got a little bit of time. A literate workforce. Literacy is not just an ability to read and write. It is an understanding of the signals used to live a civilized life. Think of how much time is spent explaining to our workers what a lathe is or simply how to use a typewriter. Waste of time means waste of money. Basic literacy across Guangdong will make our lives infinitely easier in the long run, especially if educating the populace will be costly. A square deal. Lei Chongho, a Zhuzhen construction manager working with Chong Kong, was told by his boss to show up to a certain bar in Koshu in the dead of night on his own without the usual pen and paper. Uh, of course, he had no choice but to comply, of course. Uh, no employee in his right mind, no matter how humane and just the employment settling, willingly infuriates his boss. When Lai showed up to the entrance, some security guards at the, at, he recognized from his workplace greeted him and patted him down, finding nothing except his wallet. They thanked him for his compliance and they told him not to think about what might have happened should he not comply. Lai suspected that unemployment might have been the least of his concerns. He and his boss met with a man claiming to represent the chief executive who flashed a Chung Kong lapel pin as a sign of trust. This man said, you know the public building for the utilities construction to the new outlying commuter town near Chokki? It's starting at 500,000 or so yen. Yeah. What I and the government need you to do is to go to the contract bidding and bet just above the price. Then we'll award you the contract quite like and it'll seem legitimate to outside observers. Of course, we'll make sure you reward you for your discretion. This sounds good. Lied not enthusiastically. Sure thing, sir. The representative and lies boss smile widely good. Now, how about a drink and some food? That always sounds good. Cost of quality. The updating of Guangdong's public infrastructure will, of course, require a great deal of labor. The question arises of where this labor should be sourced from. The obvious option would be to use the domestic Zhuzhen and Chinese labor. Not only this is by far the cheapest option, I also suit political ends, putting our money where our mouth is by creating jobs for these communities. Unfortunately, these local workers may lack the skill necessary to do this kind of quick, quality work that this project demands. For this reason, we may want to outsource this to more skilled Japanese laborers. But significantly more expensive and bringing them into the local, local population, but the result might just be worth it. Uh, use expensive but skilled Japanese so contractors, uh, expensive Chinese. Use cheaper, politically reliable Chinese so con contractors. Yeah, we can do that. We're only missing one vote, and we're not even in session, so. 26% corruption could be better, but could be a lot worse, too. Ah, we're back here. Good. Two a day. That's so good. Thank God. Jesus Christ. It's getting bad there for a while. Where are we at for now? Support is 50% and then 30%. It's not bad. Quality, quality. Suppress negative press. That's right. Hey, good job, guys. I think the next one will do like really well. <clears throat> so far, it's only getting better for us. Better and better and better and better and better. What is this? 
product cycle active, yeah. Ooh, we just popped up. Corruption, no, uh, we're good. Schooling shortage, illiterate workforce. And engineering scholarships. It's their name for men who detest waste while ignoring a wasted talent. Excel the virtues of hard work while telling subordinates and experience their hard work just won't cut it. The court of public opinion can't decide the better between hypocrite and plaster saint, but they unanimously agree Guangdong is full of them, especially in the halls where licenses and diplomas are made. So many Chung Kong have their working money cut out for them if Guangdong's litter eye refuses to seek out the brightest among the Zhujin and native Chinese. But that just means they get more of the bright young men working for them when they get graduate, no? Cool. Um, so that's the case. I don't... We could probably burn a little bit of Zhujin goodwill, right? 88%. Maybe? If I just want to max it out as much as possible. A precocious, a precocious youngster. Li Chun walked his younger brother, Hei, due to machinery while looking at the schematics and manuals Chun and their father brought home. As boys poured over the technical documents, he made more interesting points to build up upon those he had already been making for weeks. To Chun, uh, to, as, to the rest of the family, it was quite clear. Hei would benefit from more schooling. But clearly that was a forlorn hope. And part of the Koshu where they lived, the only remotely good schools catered only to Japanese and one or two wealthy Zhujin families. <clears throat> Moreover, what few Chinese schools existed would be of little use for Hei, who needed access to better resources. They tell only basic sums. Literacy and obedience to the state. That bet's curriculum board even why. She too had talked with her mother and father to see if she could get more, but and been crestfallen when they expected no came. As Hay continued, looking at the diagrams, copying them down, and making them more precocious observations, Chun could not bring herself uh, bring himself to puncture his beloved young brother's enthusiasm. He dared not to say that it was likely the upper limit of what someone could realistically hope for in his accursed city. A light hidden under a brush serves no purpose. Hey, look at the new one popped up. And eventually, we'll get down to Human Capital Advancement Ordinance. <coughs> the Office of Chief Executive has done much to better the fortunes of Guangdong's people since Morita's ascension. Minimum wage, work hours, safety standards, and healthcare, all these and more were bettered under the Sony CEO's fastidious watch. Monumental change enacted with an effortless signature. Progress came relatively easy thanks to his position's wide-ranging powers, and yet the very same powers can undo his work just as easily as they once wielded by an unscrupulous successor. Once, not if. At the end of things, Marie's the only man with dreams. Guangdong is adept at grinding both to nothing. Consortiums of men, on the other hand, equal parts wealth and a, a political acumen are considered to uproot. Thus, you shall assign such men as stewards, secretaries of as many legacies in health, welfare, housing, education, and others, and that they and their new office will maintain them long after he no longer can. 50 to 40. You know what? I'll just spend a little bit of goodwill right there, too. And an education we deserve. Why am I doing this again? Lamb grumbled on as the aging uh, patrol car rattled down the gravel road an hour outside Kobachu. It was unusual for the Kochi police to have anything to do outside the city, and with a passenger, no less. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, Yasukawa Yoshiko ventured uneasily, stealing a glance at Lamb's rapidly darkening expression. We're riding about the schools, and I needed an escort. <clears throat> On a day off, Lamb rolled his eyes. He resisted the urge to snap. It's like people own the place. Because it was true, not an insult. Uh, uh, the two disembarked silently 30 minutes later outside a sun-bleached wooden schoolhouse with Guangdong's tatter flag on the roof. Were not for the sight of children passing through painless windows, the building looked as if it should be abandoned or condemned. Yoshiko hesitated, eyes widening, before she walked gingerly across the desert grounds. Lamb followed wordlessly, having witnessed too many similar scenes to be surprised. Inside, two exhausted teachers faced a hundred pupils. The uniforms often patched, frayed, and a size too small. The books were torn and the chalk was broken, and the desk wobbled and creaked. For every eager child, six more were listless, unengaged by torn books and wary educators, but still preferring school over an empty home. <clears throat> These children deserve better, Officer Yoshiko's pain admission as they got back in the car, on some of them being so blindly obvious, if one were not naive, but hung heavily. Lamp felt his patience bend and snap. Have you paid attention to anything, Miss Yasukawa? Lamp said, as calm as he dared. To people, this is, is all we deserve. The ride back was silent. There's still 49 votes. Still not terrible. Hiring teachers, with a massive expansion of Guangdong's public, public education system. <clears throat> the government is once again faced with a choice. We can expand hiring of our local teachers. They'll be able to teach a curriculum better suited to the immediate needs of the communities, and Chinese and Zhujin students may find it easier to engage with lessons that are taught by teachers that have the same background as them, who can serve as role models and inspirations to succeed, of course. 
However, recruiting from the local population might be difficult uh, because of a very problem we're trying to fix, the general lack of access to education in Guangdong. It's likely that expanding a force of local teachers will require a lowering of hiring standards and accepting people who are not strictly qualified and attempting to train them on the job. The way around the problem would be to take the other approach, bringing in teachers from Japan to supplement our existing force of native teachers. The advantages are this, to this are obvious. Japan is overall much more educated than Guangdong, so finding fully qualified personnel will not be a problem. <clears throat> and with the more qualified teachers, the improvements to the education system will be able to proceed faster and more efficiently if our goal is to build an education system that matches the prestige of Japan's we want to hire the very people who currently manage the system we aim to imitate. Japan is not without its own drawbacks. Native students may find it harder to learn from foreign instructors and may be ingrained in their minds that education is not for them, but a Japanese privilege. Hire from local communities. Hire from Japan. That mine. We're going to go and do this one probably next. Tiny a bit more corruption, but that's alright. Happens. New Granada victory. Good job. Hey, house advancements in household electronics. Not bad. Hey, that stain's finally gone. <clears throat> oh, but fascist, huh? Of saints and sinners. Well, we're done with that. At least a worthy story. I don't know, Yasukawa, editor Takasaki said hesitantly. Tapping Yoshiko's handwritten draft with a red pen, our readers are looking for a letter reading. Everything there is real, Yoshiko countered. You wanted to capture the rhythm of Laugh Guangdong, this is it. <clears throat> it only took an hour for Yoshiko to write the draft after a visit to the dist dilapidated school. It was scanned on statistics and light on levity, pulling back the currents on the visible neglect and education outside the Three Pearls. It was an unvarnished look outside the bustling cities where the Japanese and wealthier Zuzhen lived, pretending that the other people lived no differently than they did. I don't know, Takasaki repeated, sucking air through his teeth. Our readers want to learn, but they also want to believe, you know, the Pan-Asian Brotherhood and all that. If you ask me, Editor Takasaki, the Pan-Asian dream isn't working. Yoshiko pressed her point home. Not for these children, our readers deserve to hear what that in their own words. Tas Takasaki fell silent. His fingers drumming the desk as the ceiling fan whirled in the background. Yoshiko tried another approach. At the very least, it'll be different from when the weeklies from Tokyo will be saying. Oh god. We can't go wrong with being original. At that, Takasaki gave a weak chuckle. He circled the article's title, a sign that would be published, and then handed the draft back to Yoshiko with a parting thought. You're starting to sound like a local, Yasukawa. Goodbye, Iberia. Part 1949, Part 2. The Crisis. The morning papers arrived while Lam was sitting down with his client, a heavy downpour crashing down in Kowloon. The paper boy, drenching from rain, gruffly put the papers down on his desk and rushed out again with an umbrella. Immersed in the conversation, Lam did not take a second glance at his bundle until he noticed it at the corner of his vision. <clears throat> he excused himself as a bold typeface proclaimed a new horror that was to freeze the, the blood in his veins. Prime Minister announced his creation of a new state. The first, read, the first line read, and its uh, subtitle did not offer much in the way of consol consolation. Guangdong to be New Manchuria. The headline went on. Exercise in Pan-Asianism? Continue on page 12. Gosh darn it, Lam thought. God darn it all. Just as the firm was getting started, he flipped through the newspaper and read the lines in a febrile panic. So what's got you so rattled, the client asked, noticing the feverish edge in Chalam's eyes. I then pulled the newspaper and showed the headline of the client. I'm sorry, sir, but we can arrange for another meeting for another time. The client looked at Lam as if he was a curious, otherworldly harlequin. Did he burst into nervous giggle? No, he said, reasserting control of himself. There'll be nothing to talk about. My business, they need all the hands on deck for the days ahead. Hope, Mr. Lam, that you'll allow me this simple lightness. It up and ran. Soon Lam himself was on the streets, his cheap suit drowning in rain. They saw throngs of people from firms just like his as they dashed to catch the fleeting taxis that led out from Kowloon to the financial districts in downtown Hong Kong. Fleeted but fleeted feet hurrying to escape the inescapable. An opening for Li Hai. Li Hai's school teacher, Mr. Wong, looked over the latest mathematics test. Finding to have no errors, he wrote out the customary 100 with two lines under it on top of the front page. And as always, Wong knew it was richly deserved. The teacher knew, as everyone else in the school did, that young Hei knew his business. The little genius was clever enough to accurately draw on machines and copy out schematics from memory while finishing his test well ahead of time and acing them to boot. Wong sat at the tragedy of it all. Though it galled him beyond belief, he knew how just useless the education he was paid to provide was. The likelihood that just was that poor Hei, like so many smart children that had come before him, stood a little chance of having a good future no matter where he stayed at the school or went to the other myriad shabby schools for Chinese in Guangdong. But his bitter thoughts were interrupted by something catching his eye. It was the front page of a Sony brochure. Sony scholarship offer. Essay contest on industrial processes in the factory the full future applicants wanted. Or applications welcomed. <clears throat> it was worth a shot. Wong thought he'd resolve to bring it up to the Hay the next day. And he said yes. As he probably should. I forgot that we could also wait to do that, uh, the corruption stuff. Yeah, probably best to wait. 
Telling the truth, there's no escaping the subject du jour of Guangdong's Japanese enclaves. Following the release of the Canton Fujian Coron's latest uh, issue, the several executives and their pressing and preening wives and a few mistresses did announce it as a slow screed, a fabrication. Some of the juniors and the younger housewives joined them, others nodded politely along, but a few said nothing, their faces pale and drawn. <clears throat> so, Lambo, open having been called to Coron's office directly, no interviews today, none, Yoshiko confirmed, was done as done. He caused one heck of a ruckus, that's for sure, Lamb said. Lagging a cigarette, don't get your hopes up. Whatever the chief executive or his kind say, you, can take, you can't take him at face value. Why not, Yoshiko asked. Then he gets a police cruiser alongside Lamb. Chief Executive Marita and Lee Kushin's histories are nothing like the rest of the suits in the government complex. One got run out of Japan, the other never finished school. They mean what they say. Lamb groaned it indifferently, but it was otherwise silent. He gazed up at the cloud of sky. Do you think they'll succeed? Yoshiko shrugged, I don't know, but if my telling the truth can make a difference, then I did my part. I did my part. The door opens wider. Another boring day, Lee Hei thighs. He stared out the window of the bleak Koshu landscape. Suddenly, something changed. <clears throat> Mr. Wong was calling him to the faculty room. He liked Mr. Wong, so he had no problem with this, though he was worried about whether he might be in trouble. When Hei got to the faculty room, he saw, found two men in suits waiting for him, and Mr. Wong smiling somewhat nervously in the corner. The men were both wearing Sony lapel pins, uh, smiling benevolently, and one of them asked Cantonese, You're Ms. Master Li Hei, I presume. Hei, or somewhat already nervous, nodded. The man smiled and pulled out a document that Hay recognized was his essay from earlier. Young master, would you like kindly walk through this essay of yours with us? Hay nodded, but he had something to say first. Sure, sirs, I'm not sure what you can do about what I'm going to tell you. Everyone says I'm smart, and that may be true, but my older brother, I admire him so much, is still smarter. We could do, he could do numbers, which watch more than just a machine, but the people at his job just have him doing tasks that a machine could be doing. The man nodded, well, we'll look into him then, but let's get on with the essay. Hay nodded and began to discuss his work. Edge is good. Good. <clears throat> and I wouldn't mind doing this one. Twelve and a half percent is pretty darn decent. Six percent. Nice. Two and a half percent. Yeah, quite. We might have to do one more here, five percent more interest, maybe. Fourteen days. Five percent. The door opens wi yet wider. Lee Chun was called away from the factory floor at a Chung Kong opening factory. True, the job was better than his old job had been, but he had not been but he had not been able to advance beyond the level he had reached at that old pestle. Despite that, he was dissatisfied to be called away and made it visible on his face as he went into the meeting room. Two men were sitting there, both had Sony lapels in the suits, and Lee noted, spoken Cantonese. Uh, despite having a distinctly Japanese look to them. One of them spoke, Mr. Lee Chuan, I presume. At least Kurt Na, the man continued, You, Mr. Lee, are lucky to have a younger brother that looks out for you. <clears throat> Lee was bemused. I knew they works lo looks out for me, sir, but how do you know that? Uh, the man smiled, looking through this essay the young master Lee Hei wrote for our essay competition and see if he recognized the conclusions. Lee read through it and was flabbergasted at the depth of his younger brother's ingenuity. I do recognize the conclusions. I even told my shift manager things to this effect, but nobody listens to me. Both men nodded. I see your talent is wasted here for all Chung Kong's merits, but what do you say to working at a Sony plan instead? As a foreman, we're going to arrange a subsidy for the young master's education too. That'll make sure he can really shine. That was his and hey, big break. He knew. I'm in, sir. So is this 20 days or 5 days? 5 days? Cool. Hey, we're going to get some pretty freaking high quality, aren't we? Oh, days until final vote. Oh, crap. Oh, that's not good. Ooh. We need one more vote. Crap. Recall 1955, July. Rita's mind reeled in shock as he had digested uh, the contents of the letter. Lee handed it over once they were alone in Lee's office. The contents were shocking, but not as much as the name on the bottom, written hand in black ink beside a blood-stained red per personal seal. Ibuka Masaru. Patent infringement. That's BS, he said, too cheerfully to be entirely natural. How can we infringe on a patent they registered after the TR-56 launched? We'll ignore it, and if his user takes us to court, we'll pay a fine. That's his personal seal, Morita muttered, fighting to keep his hands from ripping the paper apart. This just isn't some corporate legal paper. Here he's here in Guangdong, so it's personal. There's one thing he's always hated. It was people taking credit for what was his idea. Marita tossed the paper under Lee's desk with a friend's old side. It's coming for one purpose, to put us out of business. Lee bit his lip. If Ibuka was as relentless as Marita made him out to be, then all he'd have to do was slip enough cash into the presiding judge's pocket and he'd wave, have his verdict. Legal specifics be darned. And it wouldn't even take all that much, either. A Chinese company in Guangdong would draw the short stick by default. But even if they were taken to court, the TR-56 would still be valuable, pending a final verdict, selling to the untapped Chinese audience. A ghost of a smile formed on Lee's lips. If they were attacking, lacking for publicity now, then imagine what a court case properly marketed could do. So we'll do that one. Uh, 37, it's not bad. Uh, maintaining our solvency, 41 seats is not bad. We might just do 
this one though, constricting the arteries. The arteries of modern commerce is infrastructure, roads, rail, and electricity needed to harness all the energies of the people and the land to maximum economic efficiency. Despite a high level of economic development uh, being restored in the cities via Japanese aid after the war, much of the countryside still remains ill served by modern infrastructure. An easy criticism and source of resentment against the Guangdong government. This must change if Guangdong has become all that Morita and Lee want to become. So, we're going to end it there. I'm going to redo this month and make sure that we can pass this no matter what. Continue on our expansion of uh, Guangdong. If you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a fat like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll continue developing Guangdong. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great economic rest of your day.